Bret Hart in WCW. Some see the Hitman's run in World Championship Wrestling as the biggest blunder of all time, and even Bret himself has said, quite frequently, that WCW didn't have a clue how to use him correctly. When discussing this topic, we always tend to bring up two events in particular that were bad, those being Bret's WCW debut in late 1997 in his match against Goldberg at Starcade 99. Surely you'd think that in between those two years there had to be something that was good, and yeah there was. This idea that Brett's entire run in WCW was a complete failure isn't necessarily true and I do want to bring up some of these moments in today's episode of Blunder, but the bad definitely outweighed the good, and let's be honest, you're here for the bad stuff. WCW Blunder, Bret Hart, it should be a good one. We'll start at the beginning, the first two blunder points are being dished out for Brett's debut on Nitro and his debut on Pay Per View. Brett made his Nitro debut on December 15th 1997, mere weeks after the infamous Montreal Screwjob. In to say Brett was the most talked about wrestler in the entire world after Survivor Series 97 would be an incredible understatement. After Vince McMahon ordered the timekeeper to ring the bell during Brett's match against HBK and after the Brett Screwed Brett interview on WWF Raw, Vince had inadvertently created a lot of buzz around a man who was leaving his company to work for the competition. Everyone saw what happened at Survivor Series with their own eyes, yet McMahon still tried to babyface it all by calling Brett out for his lack of pro wrestling honour, for lack of a better term. Vince said Brett didn't respect the traditions of the WWF, he refused to leave the company in a better place on his way out the door by not dropping the belt. And yeah, Vince may have had a point if Brett's Survivor Series opponent didn't flat out tell Brett to his face that he wouldn't have done the honours for Brett if the shoe was on the other foot. The public knew of Sean and Brett's bad relationship, they were fully aware of Sean's own problematic history that even included issues when it came to dropping championship belts, funnily enough. So while Brett may have been a heel in the WWF at the time of his departure, there was still this underlying respect for the hitman. If you were to ask any fan during late 1997 who they would trust more to do the right thing when it came to business, not knowing anything about what these men actually talk about to their boss behind closed doors, the vast majority would say Bret Hart simply because he didn't have a history of conducting himself inappropriately. So when McMahon tried to tell fans that what happened at Survivor Series 97 was all basically Bret's own fault, Vince had inadvertently made support for the hitman a whole lot stronger. The interview was such a colossal failure that Vince had to turn into a heel TV character because he was getting booed out of arenas when he'd make television appearances. And if I were Eric Bischoff watching all this go down, I'd be gleefully rubbing my hands together and thinking of all the possibilities. Brett was coming to World Championship Wrestling, everyone knew what happened when he was in the WWF, Vince had given Brett even more momentum while Hart wasn't even on WWF television anymore, so you're essentially in a golden position where you can't fail, only, yeah, WCW failed. JJ Dillon informed Eric Bischoff that there'd be a special referee for Eric's upcoming match against Larry Sabisco at Starcade 1997, and the referee was Brett Hart. The grand idea that Bischoff and company had for Bret Hart, with all Bret's momentum that money simply can't buy, was to make him a referee in a match that was destined to be terrible. All you had to do was have Bret show up at Starcade and stare down Sting after his match against Hogan. You could have even had Bret cut a promo at Starcade where he offered his rebuttal to Vince McMahon's Bret Screwed Bret interview. Hell, imagine this, Bret could have wrestled a match at Starcade seeing as Kevin Nash's scheduled match against the Giant got scrapped. No, Bret served as a referee in the Sabisco vs Bischoff match and then he came down during the Starcade main event to serve justice to Hulk Hogan, justice the fans were confused over seeing as Sting lost via pinfall fair and square before the hitman showed up. By the time December was over Bret must have wondered what on earth had he got himself into. Following Starcade, Brett made it clear that he wanted to face Hulk Hogan one on one and this is blunder point number 3. Every time Brett calls Hogan out it's going to get a blunder point because this painfully obvious matchup never actually happened on WCW television. It honestly seemed like Bischoff was fond of throwing golden opportunities away despite there being a lot of fan interest but to be fair to Eric too, you best believe that backstage politics were the main reason for Hogan vs Hart never happening. You could also give this first challenge a buy ball, you gotta remember that there was still a lot of money to be made by presenting another Hogan vs Sting match on pay per view, seeing as Starcade 97 broke pay per view records, even though it was a terribly faulted show. 
You can see why WCW may have wanted to maybe save Bret vs Hogan for a later date, but still, the amount of times Bret called Hogan out without the match ever happening did become quite silly. Bret also said he wanted to take on Scott Hall, Kevin Nash, Randy Savage and Kurt Hennig of the NWO, but it was really Hulk Hogan that Bret was truly aiming for. Bret's been looking for Hogan for a very long time, Hogan dodged the hitman when both men were in the WWF, but this time Hogan can't run and he can't hide. It would actually turn out however that Hogan could indeed run and hide because the match never happened. Ric Flair was a man who WCW fell back on numerous times, Flair became Bret's first pay per view opponent, and I did enjoy the promos these two cut against each other in the run up to Soul Dark 98. The match itself was good too, and when I hear that old excuse of Bret being a shell of his former self when he came to WCW, I always look at Sold Out 98 and the build up to the match he had with Ric Flair. Bret was still good on the mic, he was simply fantastic inside the ropes, so I don't know, maybe, just maybe, the nonsense going on around him could have been a key factor as the why his enthusiasm began to wane. I know Bret's seen as someone who likes to complain quite a lot, but you have to remember too that Bret wasn't the only one who said WCW was nothing but shit chaos when it came to day to day operations. Young cats like Chris Jericho spoke about the madness backstage during live and tape TV days, and even business veterans like Mean Gene Okerlund spoke candidly about no one knowing what was going on mere moments before matches and promos. Anyway, the night after sold out, Bret issued a challenge. He didn't care who won the upcoming Super Brawl world title match between Sting and Hogan. The hitman wanted a world championship opportunity following the pay per view and that's blunder point number 4, because Bret wouldn't get his title opportunity until October 1999. That's right, Bret Hart, the man who came into WCW after getting screwed out of the WWF title in one of the most talked about matches of all time, didn't get booked in a televised WCW World Championship match for just under two years. In the run up to Super Brawl 8, Bret had a few run ins with members of the NWO. The idea was that Bret was going to, in his words, take the NWO down brick by brick while he awaited his title opportunity following the Hogan vs Sting match at the pay per view. Sting would end up beating Hogan, and as mentioned, the Bret vs Sting World Championship match didn't happen. Hogan, in the run up to Super Brawl, had begun a new rivalry with Macho Man Randy Savage that would serve as the genesis of the NWO Wolf Pack, so Hulk seemed a little busy. Still though, Bret would continue to call Hogan out, going as far as to call Hulk scared while Hogan would, by and large, ignore Bret and focus on Savage. Instead of headlining the next pay per view in a world title match, Bret instead wrestled the NWO's Kurt Hennig at Uncensored 98. I wanted to give this match a blunder point just because it didn't compare with their SummerSlam 91 match, but that's kinda unfair too. It was still a decent match, though certainly not the one Bret had hoped for. Bret got attacked by Rick Rude after he made Kurt submit to the sharpshooter, and then, the next night on Nitro, Bret completely dropped his World Championship aspirations to become WCW's unofficial law enforcer. He harkened back to Survivor Series 97 when he said no one should have to go through what he did. And so, from this point on, anytime Bret sees any injustice in World Championship Wrestling, he's gonna be there to make things right. Blunder point right here because what the fuck even is this? In the space of 3 months we've had Bret challenging Hogan to a match, Bret challenging the world champion after Super Brawl 8, Bret promising to dismantle the NWO brick by brick, Bret challenging Hogan again and now he's gonna serve as deputy dog while fighting crime in WCW. It's basically a load of nothing, and when you specifically look at all these promos and matches without watching anything else that happened on WCW programming, you can instantly tell that WCW had no idea what to do with Bret Hart. There's no direction and Bret's goal in WCW keeps changing week by week. This justice that Bret was planning on serving only seemed to extend to anyone who attacked his family. On the next Nitro, he went after the NWO again when the group attacked Jim Neidhart and Davey Boy Smith, yet he let High Voltage get attacked by the Giant at the very start of the show, so blunder point for being a terrible deputy dog. Again, it's a load of nothing, and the promo Bret cut about serving justice went nowhere. The following week, same thing again. Bret goes after the NWO after Bulldog and Nightheart got beaten up by the black and white, and Hart even delivers the new sheriff in town cliche after sending the NWO packing. You may be thinking that Bret was only really going after Hennig, Rude and Brian Adams during this whole thing, but no, Kurt and Rude beat up Yuji Nagata the following week on Nitro while Nagata was handcuffed to the ring ropes, and Sheriff Bret Hart was nowhere to be found. 
Instead, Brett came to the aid of Sting at the end of this show. The big players of the New World Order were given Sting a beatdown and Brett came out to help the icon. This was a step in the right direction because now, after 4 months, Brett was sharing a ring again with a world champion. Granted, he wasn't an active match participant either time he was in the ring with the world champion, but still, it is a step in the right direction. Or at least, that's what we thought. Randy Savage defeated Sting for the world title at Spring Stampede 98. He and Kevin Nash had made it clear they no longer wanted to be part of an NWO faction ran by Hulk Hogan. Hogan gets a title shot against Savage the next night on Monday Nitro, and Bret Hart delivers his form of justice by helping Hollywood Hogan win the world championship. Bret had turned heel, it was completely out of nowhere, and everything up until this point you can just flush down the toilet because it all didn't matter. Blunder point for wasting my time. Brett also attacked Roddy Piper after he helped Hogan out. In the following week, on the 27th of April 1998 episode of Nitro, Brett flat out said, verbatim, that there's no rhyme or reason and nothing makes sense anymore. I'm not even joking. He then said the hitman's finally arrived in WCW and he's sick and tired of sitting on the bench waiting for opportunities. He demands to speak to Hollywood Hogan face to face later on Nitro and yeah, the show ended with Brett sucking up to Hollywood. Hart said he's looked up to Hogan for a very long time, nobody's made more money than Hollywood, and Hogan's the most recognisable wrestler of all time. Just as Brett shows off his Hogan shirt and just as he was about to tell everyone why he wanted Hogan to win the world championship last week, Randy Savage gets in the ring and Brett gets attacked. Now, you can probably put two and two together here and come to the obvious pro wrestling conclusion. That being, Brett was about to say he wanted to take the belt off Hogan in a one on one match. It made the most sense, seeing as Brett had been clamoring for a match against Hulk ever since he arrived at WCW, but it's fine because Brett can just say what he was going to say next week or maybe the week after that. <laughs> no, it's another blunder point. Because Brett never did get a chance to show his true intentions and instead he became part of the NWO black and white. I remember there being some confusion over Brett's involvement with the group. The hitman was never seen wearing an NWO shirt and he only wore Hogan shirts any time he was with the group, and this led people to believe that Brett wasn't actually a member of the faction. I firmly believe that the story WCW were originally going for was Brett infiltrating the NWO from the inside in order to get a chance at Hogan's world belt. But as time went on, this idea was forgotten about and Brett just became a part of the NWO black and white. And the main reason why people question if Brett was actually part of the NWO really boils down to the fact that WCW made things unintentionally confusing because they kept changing plans from one week to the next. You know what, having Brett infiltrate the NWO wasn't a bad idea. He mentioned before that Hollywood was afraid of him, so having Brett gain Hogan's trust only to pull off a swerve would have been absolutely fine. But no, Brett joined the group that he once called the lowest of the low and similar to the scum he left behind in the WWF. Just one year prior to all this, Brett was leading a unique faction in the WWF known as the Hart Foundation, a group that had a very interesting purpose. And when you jump ahead and when you see how the Hitman was just another number within the ever expanding NWO factions, it actually becomes a bit sad. Oh yeah, another blunder point for Brett being a terrible recruiter. His scouting efforts were mainly focused on Sting and Chris Benoit, yet neither man joined the black and white. He did recruit Stevie Ray though, so I guess that's something. To pick up where we left off, Brett went on to Slambury where he defeated Macho Man Randy Savage. The following month, at the Great American Bash, Brett and Hogan defeated Savage and Roddy Piper when Savage got put in the sharpshooter once again. Brett fought the man he failed to recruit when he took on Chris Benoit on the June 22, 1998 episode of Nitro, and do keep in mind, this was only Brett's second match on Nitro since arriving to the company. One of the best performers in the world, if not the best at the time, having two Monday Nitro matches in the space of six months, in the middle of the Monday Night War. That deserves blunder point number 10. His first ever match for a championship belt took place at Bash at the Beach when he faced Booker T, and the belt that was up for grabs was the TV title. Brett got himself disqualified here but I'm not giving this a blunder point. Winning the TV title wouldn't have been a good look for Brett at all, so at least they went with a DQ finish. Bad booking, but the finish was fine. This match also started a new little story for Brett that I thought was good, yet it's totally forgotten about by folks who covered Brett's WCW run in the past. Brett Hart became a true hitman when he began intentionally injuring people and putting them on the shelf. 
Hart would gloat about hurting his opponents to the point they needed to take time off, and this would become his main goal on TV for a little while, just to intentionally injure folks. If Brett wasn't booked in any matches, he'd interfere and try his best to do permanent damage to people he didn't like, and superstars who fell victim to Brett's efforts included Booker T, Chris Benoit, Randy Savage, Diamond Dallas Page, and Sting. He defeated DDP on the 20th of July episode of Nitro, putting Dallas on the bench while also taking his US title. And in order to put Sting on the bench, Brett and the NWO Black and White devised a plan that went on for an entire month. Winning the US belt seemed to change Brett's way of thinking. He said he wanted to be a fighting champion, and he also said he stayed on the outer fringe of the NWO out of respect for Sting. Sting's a man who Brett admires, he likes that Sting uses the same finish that he does, and Brett felt WCW turned their backs on Sting in 1996 the same way the WWF turned their backs on Brett in 1997. After giving this speech, Brett and Sting would form a rocky relationship that was all based around Hart trying to prove that he was a changed man. He would try to help Sting out from time to time, the NWO noticed what Brett was doing, and the faction would then start to slowly distance themselves from the hitman. By the time Fall Brawl 98 took place, Brett's own NWO teammates Hulk Hogan and Stevie Ray decided to attack him in the middle of the match, and it looked like Brett was now completely done with the New World Order. After this attack, Brett wanted fans to forgive him. Roddy Piper came to the ring to also ask fans to forgive the hitman after giving Brett an earful, so it looked like Brett was going back to being a babyface and he once again went after Hollywood Hogan. The Bret Hart vs Hulk Hogan match was finally booked for the 28th of September 1998 episode of Nitro. The world title wasn't up for grabs, but the booking of this match sure did make people pay attention. Fans tuned in to finally see this clash between two legitimate legends of pro wrestling, and it played out in the worst way possible. After about three and a half minutes of action, Hart got dropped on the guardrail and it looked like he was injured. He needed medical attention and the match was called off. This prompted Sting to come out to take Brett's place, so the hitman was brought back up the ramp in a stretcher while Sting took on Hollywood Hogan. When Sting was just about to put Hogan in the Scorpion Deathlock, Bret Hart returned to the ring and he planted Sting with a DDT, meaning the whole thing was a giant, elaborate and drawn out swerve that, when you think about it, didn't really mean all that much. The world title wasn't up for grabs, characters and allegiances didn't change, Bret could have DDT'd Sting way back in July and the results would have been the exact same come September time. It's this kind of writing that made WCW feel pointless at times because storylines that you thought were going somewhere usually ended up with the guys involved being right back in the same place they started off. So yeah, blunder point for the Bret vs Hogan match being absolutely dreadful, and another blunder point for the elaborate swerve that didn't really progress anything from a storyline perspective. And yes, I know what you're thinking, Bret screwing Sting over was what led to their pay per view match, but the swerve was still completely unnecessary. Brett could have attacked Sting weeks prior while still remaining a heel and the match would have been set up just like that. You don't need to pull off swerves to get a match in the ring if both guys are already babyfaces and heels respectively. Sting and Brett would have their match at Halloween Havoc 98 and it could have and should have been way better. They did make up for it a year later at the Mayhem pay per view, but right here Brett went back to his old ways by putting Sting on the shelf. Sting got wrecked with his own baseball bat and he wouldn't be seen again until March of 1999. Brett would lose the US title to DDP the night after Halloween Havoc. He then wrestled Paige in the World War 3 1998 main event and again the hitman fell victim to the diamond cutter. The night after World War 3, Brett wrestled Dean Malenko in their one and only match, and Brett held a lot of resentment towards Dean when this one was all said and done. Brett suffered a groin injury here that would later require surgery, and Brett would go on to say Malenko wasn't as good as everyone made him out to be. As a matter of fact, Dean Malenko was quite reckless. Personally, I don't think Dean deserves such harsh words from Brett, seeing as it is pro wrestling after all, but then again, I'm not the one in the ring. Anyway, Brett reclaimed his US belt a week later from DDP, and from here, Brett would use the groin injury as a way to duck out of matches. He would famously say he had a groin injury the likes of Mean Gene and Dean Malenko had never seen before in their whole lives, and in a great hitman moment, Brett said he had defend his title against a worthy opponent, a worthy opponent by the name of El Dandy. El Dandy, according to Brett, was a jam up guy and a serious professional, someone who Mean Gene shouldn't doubt, and when Mean Gene shot this idea down, Brett said he'd instead defend his US belt against hypnosis, a high flyer of the highest magnitude. 
Hypnosis was actually psychosis, but small details, right? In the end, it was Roddy Piper who defeated Brett for the US Championship on the February 8th, 1999 episode of Nitro, and it was all thanks to some help from Will Sasso. Brett would then wrestle a couple more matches on TV, and then he had to go and get surgery. Before leaving though, Brett called out Bill Goldberg. This happened on the 22nd of March 1999 episode of Nitro. And Brett, once again, also managed to call out Hulk Hogan during this promo, but he didn't challenge him to a match. He just said he had finally lost patience waiting for the match to happen. As far as Goldberg was concerned, the hitman was getting a bit fed up of all the hype. And besides, Goldberg hadn't faced someone like Bret Hart during his entire undefeated streak. The following week, in a moment that Brett recalls fondly when talking about his WCW career, Goldberg speared the hitman in the Toronto Air Center while Brett was wearing a steel plate. The reaction Brett got here was extremely good, but the hitman couldn't carry the momentum forward. He had to take time off. And this time off, unfortunately, got extended when Brett's brother Rowan passed away at the WWF Over the Edge pay-per-view in May. Brett stayed away for a further four months, only coming back to say he didn't really know if he was going to return to the ring or not. But when Brett did make his return in September 99, the same old nonsense started up once again, and it was back to Blunderville for the hitman. Brett said flat out that he had only come back to WCW full time if he got his match against Hulk Hogan. No nonsense, no NWO swerves, seeing as the faction was done for at this point. Hart vs Hogan for the World Championship needed to happen and Hart made it clear that he would only return to the ring for this matchup. Quote Brett Hart, I can't and I won't come back until I get that one match. What would end up happening the following week? Brett teamed up with Hogan to face Sting and Lex Luger. You couldn't make it up, so that's another blunder point. This company couldn't keep a line of continuity that spanned over the course of seven days. Another highlight came for Brett due to terrible circumstances. He got to wrestle a tribute match for his late brother Rowan against Chris Benoit on the October 4th, 1999 episode of Nitro. And even though everything surrounding this match was dark and bleak, it's still considered one of, if not the, greatest match that ever happened on Monday Nitro. Eric Bischoff was then fired, Vince Russo came in as the new head writer, and one of the things Russo wanted to do upon entering the company was to raise Bret Hart up to the same position he was in when working for WWF. For all his faults, it was Russo who wanted to make Bret the company's world champion, and so the hitman finally won the world belt following a tournament that concluded at WCW Mayhem 99. It's funny too because even though Russo was the one who put Brett in the position he wanted to be in for so long, Brett still, to this day, doesn't speak highly of Vince Russo. As a matter of fact, he's called him a stupid idiot. I've always thought that Brett would never have gotten that championship if the Bischoff and Hogan regime stayed in power, but again, what do I know? I nor anyone else making these kind of videos were privy to what was going on in the backstage area. A storyline also began around six weeks before Brett won the championship, one that centered around Kevin Nash and Scott Hall. Basically, this would build up to yet another giant swerve where Bret Hart turned heel once again to lead a version of the NWO that was named NWO 2000. Now, before we get to that, we've probably got the biggest and most important blunder of all, the kick Bret Hart took from Bill Goldberg at Starcade 99. This kick left Brett in a very bad state, and even before the kick happened, Brett banged his head off the floor when going for his figure 4 ring post spot, a spot he had done dozens of times safely, and another accident he blames on Bill Goldberg. Either way, it doesn't matter, the consequences of this match would eventually lead to Brett calling it quits, and the match lives on in infamy because, still to this day, Bret Hart rips in the Goldberg at every given opportunity. I could give further blunder points for the matches Brett wrestled after Starcade 99, but he didn't know how bad his concussion was. He had a rematch against Goldberg that ended with the formation of NWO 2000. He wrestled Jerry Flynn, and actually, you know what, I'm giving this one a blunder point because booking Bret Hart against Jerry Flynn is just plain stupid, concussion or no concussion. This one's been removed from WWE Network for some reason, but I'm assuming the guy responsible for making such edits knew how bad the match was. Brett then wrestled Terry Funk in a hardcore match that probably wasn't the best idea. He wrestled four house show dates against Sid Vicious and Ric Flair. His final WCW match was against Kevin Nash on the 10th of January 2000, and it sold out 2000, it was announced that Bret Hart had vacated the championship. 
NWO 2000 wasn't good so that gets a blunder point too. There is a little nostalgia tied to hearing the NWO music and seeing the NWO logo, but if we're being honest here, the rebirth of this once groundbreaking faction really did feel half-baked and it was void of any original ideas. There was hope that Brett would come back to the ring one day, he made odd appearances here and there on Nitro where it seemed like he was setting himself up for future matches, but Hart never got cleared and he didn't step foot in a ring again until his WWE return 10 years later. I'm also going to give a blunder point for Brett's last WCW promo. Russo was back in charge when this one went down and Brett spent his time complaining about the injury he sustained at the hands of Goldberg. While many would say Brett was right to publicly tear Bill apart for what happened, it's still a terrible way to end your run. Brett came off as very bitter and for sure it was another work shoot that was handed to Brett from Russo, but it would have been nice if this promo was just Brett saying goodbye, not a scathing teardown of everything that went wrong during Starcade 99. All of Brett's final appearances seemed to centre around how the company wronged him and yeah, they totally did. It's just a little depressing to get reminded about it all over again. Well, Bret Hart's run in WCW comes in second on our Blunder leaderboard, which just shows how stupid our leaderboard really is. As mentioned before though, don't be taking this serious at all, it's just a bit of fun. Really, when watching Brett's run back again, you're left with a lot of questions you'd love to get truthfully answered, but the problem here is that nearly all parties involved conveniently forget the fine details, or they just flat out spew venom and speak terribly about the whole thing. I do like Eric Bischoff, I'm not afraid to admit it either, but he's been caught out lying a few times now on his podcast and he's contradicted himself when doing TV interviews and things of that nature. So as much as I enjoy Bischoff's work, it's really hard to use him as a true source of information and you know that sucks seeing as he should be the prime go-to guy for this kind of research. Brett does recall moments he enjoyed in WCW such as the Goldberg Spear in Toronto, but these moments are always presented as a side note either before or after he's done calling everyone who worked in WCW a bunch of idiots, so that's about as far as that goes. There's also Vince Russo and yeah, th this one goes without saying. Russo is a key figure throughout this entire era of pro wrestling and I do find his perspectives fascinating to listen to, but his overall opinion on certain matters can sometimes draw him away from what really went down. I do my best to put these videos together as a fan who only sees how things transpire on TV. At the end of the day, the whole fan experience is what's being presented to us as consumers of this wacky form of entertainment known as pro wrestling. Guys like Bischoff and Russo were there, they know what happened so they should really be the go to guys for what went on behind the scenes, but as a consumer of pro wrestling and someone who sees the final product after all the backstage nonsense takes place, I have no hesitation at all saying Brett's run was absolutely terrible and WCW did Brett dirty from the day he got there. That stuff about Brett being a shell of his former self when he arrived at WCW, it's a dog shit excuse. As someone who hired the guy and as someone who paid him an extortionate amount of money, it should be on you to build him back up, make him feel like he has a new home and don't mess him or anybody else about by consistently changing TV plans at the drop of a hat. What really stands out for me though is the fact that Golden playing his day in your face opportunities that were presented on the shiniest silver platters were simply not taken, and maybe even more concerning is the fact that there was zero consistency when booking bread on a weekly basis. Not a monthly basis, not a pay per view to pay per view basis, but a weekly basis. You could tell just by watching TV that storylines were being scrapped and you could tell Brett's general direction was all over the place, and for someone of Brett's caliber during the Monday Night Wars to go through that kind of shit, it's just flat out comical. Hell, Bischoff even said that Brett was hired mainly to appear on Thunder as the main star of that new TV show, yet he only wrestled on Thunder a total of 4 times during his first year. If they couldn't get it right that early on, then really, what chance did Brett have? Anyway, the comment section is open as always, so share your thoughts and let me know what you think. I do hope you enjoyed this video and until next time, please take care.